Hello, and welcome to this APCO basic science objective video about gestational diabetes. The objectives of this video are, review the risk factors for gestational diabetes mellitus, or GDM. Describe glucose metabolism relative to normal maternal physiology adaptation in pregnancy. Understand the pathophysiology of impaired glucose metabolism in GDM. Outline the approach to screening and diagnosis of GDM. Understand how altered glucose metabolism in GDM can affect the fetus. And identify and describe the mechanism of action, pharmacokinetics, and therapeutic use of hypoglycemic agents used to treat GDM. Thanks for having me on the clerkship. My end of rotation presentation is on gestational diabetes. As you all know, gestational diabetes is defined as carbohydrate intolerance that starts with the onset of pregnancy. There are two types. A1 is diet controlled, and A2 requires medications to control maternal blood glucose levels. Women can come into pregnancy with known pregestational diabetes, undiagnosed pregestational diabetes, or they can develop diabetes through the course of their pregnancy. The greatest risk for diabetic embryopathy or major malformations are in those women with poorly controlled pregestational diabetes that is either known or unknown. These risks are mainly neurologic, skeletal, cardiovascular, and renal. Neurologic abnormalities include anencephaly, hollow prosencephaly, and microencephaly. The most common skeletal abnormalities include sacral agenesis and caudal agenesis. There can be a variety of cardiovascular abnormalities. These include ventricular septal defect, transposition of the great vessels, patent ductus arteriosus, and pulmonary stenosis. Finally, renal abnormalities include duplication of the ureter and renal agenesis. In some cases, hypospadias can also be seen. Metabolic alterations in poorly controlled diabetes in pregnancy, specifically during embryogenesis, are associated with teratogenesis. These metabolic alterations include hyperglycemia, ketone body excess, somatomedin inhibition, arachidonic acid deficiency, and free oxygen radical excess. Gestational diabetes, or diabetes whose onset was during pregnancy, complicates 7% of all pregnancies. However, there is variation between populations with Hispanic and Asian women having the highest incidence and African American and Caucasian women having the lowest. Major risk factors for developing gestational diabetes include prior pregnancy complicated by gestational diabetes, maternal BMI over 30, previous macrosomic fetus, known impaired glucose metabolism such as polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS, and family history. Pregnancy may actually unmask a genetic predisposition to type 2 diabetes. This may be why women who develop gestational diabetes are at increased risk for developing overt type 2 diabetes later in life. Before we talk about the pathophysiology itself, let's review the normal physiological changes of pregnancy that alter glucose metabolism. The goal of glucose metabolism in pregnancy is to ensure an adequate source of glucose for the fetus and the mother. Pregnancy is a diabetogenic state with progressively increasing postprandial glucose levels and increasing fasting insulin levels. At the same time, there is a suppression of hepatic insulin sensitivity, which contributes to higher glucose levels. Human placental lactogen, or HPL, is a single-chain peptide that is synthesized by the trophoblast and secreted into the maternal circulation. HPL is produced to promote nutrition for the fetus and is a strong anti-insulin. In maternal circulation, it leads to decrease in peripheral sensitivity to maternal insulin. Simultaneously, estrogen and progesterone are stimulating pancreatic beta cell hypertrophy, leading to increased insulin release. In order to utilize this increased circulating glucose, the placenta upregulates the expression of the GLUT1 transport by two to three-fold. The GLUT1 transport allows glucose to enter fetal circulation via facilitative diffusion. So folks, do we have any questions before we move on to the development of gestational diabetes? Let's pause, think, and apply. If there are elevated glucose levels that are physiologic in pregnancy, why are early elevated glucose levels so dangerous in a woman who has uncontrolled pregestational diabetes? The incidence of birth defects increases linearly with a degree of maternal hyperglycemia. 
Research has revealed that severe hyperglycemia induces oxidative stress, which activates cellular signals that may lead to dysregulation of gene expression and cause apoptosis in certain target organs. During embryogenesis, this results in the various malformations as we previously reviewed. Okay, so with that in mind, let's take a look at the pathophysiology of gestational diabetes. The normal insulin resistance in pregnancy is further exaggerated, leading to even higher fasting insulin levels and further decrease in hepatic insulin sensitivity. This leads to higher serum glucose levels. This may be in part related to higher HPL levels. Additionally, there is decreased insulin sensitivity in skeletal muscle. AS defect in the signaling cascade decreases the ability of the insulin receptor beta subunit to undergo tyrosine phosphorylation. Therefore, there is a 25% lower uptake of serum glucose. Given the main feature of GDM is insulin resistance, the diagnosis is made through a glucose challenge test. There are several strategies for screening. Currently, in the US, all new OB patients are screened for risk factors for gestational diabetes during their first prenatal visit. Those with risk factors are given an early 50 gram glucose tolerance test over the course of an hour. All other patients are given a screening 50 gram glucose tolerance test at 26 to 28 weeks gestation. Those with an abnormal result are then given a 100 gram confirmatory glucose challenge test. The ultimate goal of treatment for those diagnosed is to lower serum glucose levels during pregnancy. This can be done first through diet. If that fails to produce adequate results, current studies support use of insulin as the first line agent. Other medications such as glaburide and metformin can be utilized along with monitoring fasting and postprandial blood sugars. Although new agents are available to treat type 2 diabetes in non-pregnant patients, they are not readily used for gestational diabetes. It is important to discuss with patients the implications of poorly controlled gestational diabetes. For the fetus in utero, excessive glucose transport can result in excessive fetal insulin and fetal growth. Fetal fat preferentially increases at the shoulders and abdomen. The accelerated growth can place the fetus at risk for birth complications such as shoulder dystocia, fetal intolerance of labor, or cesarean delivery. There is also an increased risk of polyhydramnios, which can increase risk for preterm labor. Now let's pause, think, and apply. A patient with gestational diabetes has polyhydramnios and goes into preterm labor at 30 weeks. What are the ramifications of administering betamethasone for lung maturity in this patient? Betamethasone is a glucocorticoid and it will cause an elevation in maternal serum glucose levels. Normally, this can be mitigated by the body's normal glucose metabolism. But in someone with severe insulin insensitivity, such as this patient, additional monitoring and potentially insulin may be needed. The effects can be seen for up to two weeks after administration of betamethasone. At the time of delivery, the neonate will continue to produce the high levels of insulin it made during intrauterine life as a function of exposure to prolonged elevated maternal serum glucose. The elevated insulin levels can continue for the first 24 hours after birth leading to profound neonatal hypoglycemia. These neonates are also at risk for hypercalcemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and polycythemia. In the long term, these neonates can go on to develop childhood obesity and are at increased risk for overt type 2 diabetes themselves. Maternal risks include the risk of cesarean section and severe perineal lacerations. Women with gestational diabetes are also at a 20-30% to 30 increased risk of preeclampsia and a 50% increased risk for developing type 2 diabetes within 10 years. So folks, are there any more questions? You mentioned the use of insulin, metformin, and glyburide. Can you talk a little about how metformin and glyburide work to decrease maternal blood glucose levels? Ah, uh, yes, let's start with glyburide. It is a second-generation sulfonylurea and therefore should not be used in patients with a sulfa allergy. Glyburide stimulates insulin secretion from beta cells by binding to the ATP calcium channel receptors in peripheral tissues. Metformin is a biguanide and works to improve insulin sensitivity in the liver, thereby reducing hepatic gluconeogenesis. It also improves intestinal and peripheral glucose uptake through improved insulin sensitivity. The mainstay of therapy for many patients will still be insulin. 
Insulin can be long-acting, intermediate-acting, rapid-acting, or very rapid-acting. Long-acting insulin is usually administered daily, occasionally twice a day. Intermediate insulin, such as NPH, is one of the most common insulin regimens and is given twice a day in conjunction with rapid-acting regular insulin used at meals. Very rapid-acting insulin, such as Aspart or Lyspro, can also be useful in conjunction with long-acting insulin with meals. All right, any more questions? If not, thank you so much for your attention and your amazing teaching on the OB service. This concludes this APGO Basic Science Objective video about gestational diabetes. You should be able to review the risk factors for gestational diabetes mellitus, or GDM. Describe glucose metabolism relative to normal maternal physiology adaptation in pregnancy. Understand the pathophysiology of impaired glucose metabolism in GDM. Outline the approach to screening and diagnosis of GDM. Understand how altered glucose metabolism in GDM can affect the fetus. And identify and describe the mechanism of action, pharmacokinetics, and therapeutic use of hypoglycemic agents used to treat GDM. Thanks for watching.